Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to t tell you about my work and also to tell you all about dynamos. So this topic has uh, fo formed the larger part of my research work up until now. Uh, it was presented to me during my PhD and it has been a running theme all along my research career. So the title of this talk is obviously inspired by the title of the uh, novel by Charles Dickens. And these are his famous opening lines which have a very universal quality. So I would like to kind of just read out a bit. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, the epoch of incredulity, season of light and season of darkness, and so on. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the super little degree of comparison only. So I think this also aptly describes the research world of dynamos. So before I launch into the tale of two dynamos, I would like to briefly sketch uh, my research path up until now. My, my work falls into um, broadly into the category of astrophysical fluid dynamics and plasma astrophysics, um, beginning with turbulent dynamos, which I worked on during my PhD in Ayuka. And then at Princeton, I worked on magnetorotational instability, which is an important thing in accretion disks, and uh, explored the dynamo connection therein. Then I went, went to MIT and worked on uh, what is known as magnetic reconnection, and that I'll be talking to you about tomorrow. So this is the brief outline for today's talk. Um, since I'm invoking dynamos to understand the origin of uh, coherent astrophysical magnetic fields, the, I want to first up provide some motivation. Then I'll introduce uh, MHT equations and di turbulent dynamo theory. I particularly want to emphasize on the importance of small scale dynamo and highlight some of its astrophysical applications. Uh, the core of today's discussion will be with regards to the interaction between the small scale dynamo and the large scale dynamo. The overarching question there being, um, is small scale dynamo problematic for large scale dynamo at high magnetic Reynolds number? I will try to convince you that this is not the case. We see in numerical simulation, direct numerical simulations, that there is a, what is known as unified dynamo in the kinematic phase, followed by a quasi-kinematic large scale dynamo. And I'll summarize and provide some future directions. So the motivation to study this topic comes simply from observations. So on the left, I have uh, in this panel the optical image of sun with some uh, dark spots known as the sunspots. So these regions are regions of intense magnetic fields. And these intense magnetic fields inhibit transport of heat and so make the region a bit cooler uh, than the surrounding one, which makes it look dark. So in panel B, I have a magnetogram which shows uh, these magnetic, intense magnetic fields around the sunspot regions, uh, with the black and white indicating the polarities of the magnetic field. Then here I have a longitudinally averaged radial magnetic field plotted along for many, many years. And you can see these uh, kind of patterns that emerge from this plot. And this is indicative of this magnetic cycle, uh, cyclic activity in the sun. And there's a certain period associated with this activity. It's of a duration of 22 years. And this is known as the sunspot cycle. And this is indicative of the large scale spatio-temporal organization of the magnetic field. And it is not only um, in sun, but also on really large objects like galaxies. For example, I have spiral galaxy here, M51. Uh, the optical image is overlaid by some radio contours. And there are these um, yellow lines, which are probably not seen very well due to the light. Um, but the yellow lines are very well aligned. Uh, they are basically uh, magnetic field vectors. And they seem to be very well aligned along the spiral arms of this galaxy depicting that there's this really large scale magnetic field. 
So you would wonder, right, that where do these really large scale magnetic fields come from? How are these magnetic fields mapped? Um, so you get radio observations from uh, the, uh, the, the galaxy, and then you can uh, look at the polarization data of the radio uh, observations, and then you can uh, determine the magnetic field. Of course, you're getting only one component if you're looking at this polarization data, uh, but it kind of gives you an idea of how the magnetic field is um, structured on this galaxy. Because you have magnetic fields from yeah, so wherever you have magnetic fields, from there you are going to get radio radio data, and I will come to why it, that's so the case. Sun. So the sun, um, typically you you can you do uh, Zeeman observations, Zeeman splitting observations. So it's not only in you know sun and galaxies, also in in, in larger objects like galaxy clusters, which are the largest bound objects in the universe, you have coherent magnetic fields. So here I have read Hydra cluster. This is a high, uh, galaxy cluster containing many, many galaxies bunched together. Um, and if I look at it in radio towards the center, uh, there are these jets coming out of uh, a black hole. And you can see them in radio. and that, that essentially means that there must be magnetic fields in there. Then again, um, uh, here's a study of uh, Faraday rotation measures from galaxy clusters. So there are 16 galaxy clusters. And um, what is plotted here is uh, the rotation measure um, along the distance from the center of the galaxy. So as you come towards the center of the galaxy cluster, um, there are higher and higher values of rotation measures which are being seen, which means that there must be magnetic fields which are contributing to uh, getting such high values of rotation measures. So overall, we have a sufficient evidence that there are these large scale magnetic fields in the universe which need to be understood. So why should we care about these magnetic fields? It's, it's a plasma universe out there. So most astrophysical objects are, uh, are in plasma form, containing coherent magnetic fields. So it forms a fundamental physics question. Then um, importantly, they provide, uh, they are important for you know, star and um, galaxy astrophysics. They provide fluid properties and uh, can help in understanding star formation and galaxy formation, and can facilitate turbulence and accretion disks, have diverse roles to play. Um, they can be responsible for cosmic ray propagation, particle ac acceleration, and so on. So the other thing that I just mentioned to you before is uh, the fact that uh, the presence of magnetic fields is responsible for you to see uh, certain objects in, at radio wavelengths. That's because the relativistic electrons over there are going to gyrate around these uh, magnetic fields, um, giving rise to a synchrotron emission. So in this quest to understand the origin of magnetic fields, the paradigm that has emerged um, most popular and most um, significant is the paradigm of turbulent dynamos. So broadly, okay, before I tell you more about uh, what kind of dynamos are there. So turbulent dynamos basically convert kinetic energy of turbulent motions to magnetic energy. And broadly, they are classified into two types. So there is large scale dynamo and then there is small scale dynamo. So in a given turbulent system, there's a certain scale at which energy is being injected into the system. And if these turbulent motions grow magnetic fields at scales smaller than that energy injection scale, that is known as a small scale dynamo. And um, conversely, if these motions um, grow fields on scales larger than the energy injection scale, that is known as a large scale dynamo. So I have tried to depict this in, in, in this small cartoon. 
So this is magnetic energy versus wave number. Here you have the energy injection scale and this is where the energy gets dissipated. And these scales are the small scales and these are large scales. And um, so here is where the small scale dynamo is going to be active and the large scale dynamo will work here. Uh, well, so if you look at different astrophysical systems, um, the manifestation of dynamo action over there would be different depending on the nature of the underlying turbulence. So for example, in the sun, you have both small scale and large scale dynamo. But uh, that's because in the sun, we have uh, differential rotation and so on. Uh, whereas in galaxy clusters, where the rotation is very weak, you don't have, you don't necessarily have large scale dynamo action. So only small scale dynamo is expected in galaxy clusters. You will always have small scale dynamo. Yeah, it's very generic. Yeah. Uh, no, no. So in the sun, we are looking at uh, dynamos from uh, in the convection zone. So there's a radiative zone where your uh, which is towards the core of the sun, and then there's a convection zone where you know the the, the heat is being transported a lot due to convection, and so that creates turbulent motions, and the dynamo is. Yes. Yeah. 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 Smaller, smaller, uh, yeah, this, the size of the convection, which is uh, after 0.7 uh, solar radius. So, yeah, it's in the, in the outer region, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's the, that's a very fun, important question, which I have looked at during my so I'll be coming to that and telling you more about it. So at times I'm just trying to understand when you have these, these supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies, how this is it does it also fit into the string? Well, uh, typically when you look at suppose you look at galaxies. We are looking at the gas in the galaxy, which is in the spiral arms, or I mean, which is being released by you know. Yeah, the 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 supermassive black hole will sit in the center. But then those emit often these very high energy. Yeah, that's, that's more. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, I mean, there's an underlying question there also that where do the magnetic fields come from? Because to do any of that stuff, you need magnetic fields, uh, which is going to, you know, collimate the flow and so on. So there is a question there also for so magnetic that fields. Doesn't fit into, I mean, that's sort of outside your. No. Um, well, typically when you talk of accretion disk mag uh, magnetic fields. Uh, because these supermassive black holes usually have this, these accretion disks around them where, you know, mass is accreting onto the black hole, which is powering all those, you know, jets and so on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, so this accretion disk can bring in magnetic fields in principle. And uh, then that, those magnetic fields can kind of do the work of, you know, shooting out jets and so on. So, um, but uh, that, that, that particular system that I just described to you is also slightly more special uh, in the sense that um, it's not uh, the standard dynamo action that we think operates there. It's something called uh, MRI which operates over there and the dynamo connection there and, and which is not something I'm going to talk about today. Oh, yeah, yeah, some of the stuff to understand. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So one can ask, what about primordial fields? Uh, 
in the sense that do we really need dynamo action to understand the origin of magnetic fields? Suppose in early universe there were uh, there, there were magnetic fields which came in and uh, uh, they are just there and what we see today is simply those magnetic fields. But that would not be the case because uh, most of these systems that I'm uh, describing are uh, essentially turbulent in nature and uh, that would uh, simply uh, destroy those magnetic fields over a very short scale of time due to turbulent dissipation. So you, instead you can actually use the turbulence to beget dynamo action and then may grow and maintain these fields. So I just wanted to briefly tell you that the, these are the sources in, of turbulence in various uh, objects. So in the sun we have convection which uh, carries the matter and heat from cooler regions to um, hotter regions and so on. So in this uh, process it generates turbulence. In galaxies, we have supernovae. So these happen at the end of a star cycle. So they go supernovae and then they generate turbulence in the, in the galaxy and so on. In galaxy clusters, you can have galaxy mergers, which could be the source of driving turbulence. So uh, one thing that I wanted to say is that um, it is easy to generate magnetic energy, but the, uh, the, the more important question is how do we get these really uh, large-scale organized magnetic fields, which is the more intriguing question. Yeah. So now I want to provide a brief MHD primer. So I have Maxwell Ampere's law here and Ohm's law, which, uh, which relates electric field, magnetic field, and current density. So if I were to eliminate current density, then I, then I get this, this equation here. And I'm going to be dropping the displacement term because uh, the kind of uh, plasmas that I'm looking at are all uh, non-relativistic and this term is uh, unimportant there. So you get an expression for the electric field and then that you can substitute into the Faraday's law and then arrive upon the induction equation. And the induction equation now you can see has two terms. Uh, one is the advective term, which is responsible for carrying around the magnetic field and doing various things to it, including the dynamo action. Um, and the other term is the diffusive term, or responsible for destruction of the magnetic field. And um, if I take the ratio of these two terms, I can get a dimensionless number known as the magnetic Reynolds number. And typically, in most astrophysical systems, the magnetic Reynolds number is really large. Um, so in the sun, it is 10 to the power of 6. In galaxies, it is 10 to the power of 19 or whatever. I mean, they are ridiculously large. Um, so if you were to actually drop the resistive term, uh, then the remaining equation uh, implies what is known as flux freezing. So, in flux freezing, what you have is the, 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 the magnetic flux uh, in, in a given area which is moving along the fluid remains constant in time. So that is known as uh, flux freezing and it will be important to understand uh, dynamo action. Right, so to make an estimate of how large this term is, one uses this uh, this uh, this relation. T is temperature, yeah, and uh, basically from some kinetic physics. Uh, so is the conductivity or eta is the resistivity? Yeah. Collisionality. You are mean free path, and yeah, you are in the, yeah. So um, the momentum equation now will co uh, contain the Lorentz force. And uh, besides that, I have the, the, the pressure term and then the, the viscous term. And this small f is going to be the, the forcing term or the term which is responsible for turbulence. Um, so in, 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 in co combination with continuity equation, now we have the, the three equations for magnetohydrodynamics. I've not considered the energy equation here, mainly because in all my work, I have taken the, the underlying gas to be uh, isothermal. So it's uh, the, the energetics have been dropped. 
Um, so th these are some important points I want to just tell you so that uh, kind of builds um, a base for the understanding that is required to, for later on. So this is the induction equation. And the basic dynamo problem uh, historically has been to ask what kind of flows or velocity flows. So you can see that the, the equation is linear in B. So I, I can ask what kind of flows will lead to dynamo action. And over a period of time, um, <coughs> what has been seen is that, um, okay, before that, uh, it is important to understand uh, that there are there can be slow dynamos and fast dynamos. So fast dynamos are the ones in which the growth rate doesn't depend on a magnetic Reynolds number. So um, then people found out that uh, typically flows which lead to fast dynamo actions tend to be chaotic or random or turbulent. Now, um, since we are dealing with a stochastic system, um, to understand dynamo action on large or small scales, we will be dealing with a dynamical equation relate, uh, for B mean in case of large scale dynamo action. And, uh, B fluctuations or this magnetic correlator in case of small scale dynamo action. So this is uh, the essential difference mathematically. Uh, then if you want, want to do simulations of dynamos, then um, in case of small scale dynamo, all you need is a non-helical turbulence, which is very generic in the sense that you can just have homogeneous isotropic turbulence and that will lead to small scale dynamo. But if you... You mean in terms of fluctua fluctuations? Yeah, uh, but um, these fluctuations may not be sufficient to give you like a large scale dynamo action. Yeah, uh, but if you kind of, the forcing is actually helical to begin with, then that, that will lead to large scale dynamo action. The yeah, the underlying. Yeah, that's in the case of sun. Huh. So there, if because the driving of the turbulence is related to convection, so naturally, uh, uh, you know that that comes in, uh, but. You can simply drive a system without, you know, resorting to convection. You can just, yeah, drive turbulence, some forcing. So here I have. Sorry, so that means that you're saying applies more to systems like in the galaxies and so on. Convection. Well, it can apply to sun also because what I'm trying to understand here is basically um, like a more fundamental, I'm trying to understand fundamentally what are the different uh, characteristics of dynamos, uh, which can be independent of how you force the turbulence. So it doesn't matter what what is it? I mean, maybe at some level, sunspots will become important and so on, but that is a second order question. So here uh, I'm showing you um, a typical case of how the magnetic field evolves in a given simulation. So we have a seed magnetic field, which decays, latches onto an eigenfunction, and then grows. And this is exponential uh, scale, uh, sorry, logarithmic scale. So it grows exponentially. And this initial, this exponential uh, growth stage is known as the kinematic regime where the Lorentz force is not yet important. And once the Lorentz force becomes important, it leads to saturation of the dynamo. So now I want to expand upon the small scale or the fluctuation dynamo. Um, the small scale dynamo is very generic. It doesn't need special things like the way the large scale dynamo needs, like uh, the large scale dynamo needs helical turbulence. I mean, what it 
essentially means is it needs breaking of the mirror symmetry of the underlying turbulence. And then it is also very fast growing. It, 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 it grows on eddy turnover time scales, whereas the large scale dynamo is slightly slower. So I want to show you a movie of uh, the small scale dynamo. So this is, we are solving the MHD equations uh, on, a Cartesian, on a Cartesian system with a forcing function which is non-helical and so we expect only small scale dynamo and you can see that these magnetic fields are coming up and uh, essentially the blue and the white uh, or yellow are kind of the oppositely directed magnetic fields. And um, so what's going on over here is that the fields, the magnetic field is being uh, randomly stretched out. And as it is randomly stretched out, um, the, suppose you're considering like a flux tube. So then the area of the flux tube is going down. But due to flux freezing concept or the magnetic flux conservation, even though the area is, is going down, the magnetic field strength is going up. So that's, that's the way the dynamo is acting. So this random stretching, uh, you stretch it once and then again twice. And so this, this is like a, a exponentially growing magnetic field. Um, and while this is happening, you are putting the magnetic field into smaller and smaller volumes because you're continually stretching it out, which makes the system intermittent in nature. Okay. Um, the, so the first person who so there need to work out whether stretching winds or fattening winds. Yeah, uh, stretching winds or um, I mean, I can do the reverse, like, like just make it fatter rather than stretch. So the, the the person who makes it fatter is the Lorentz force, who kind of uh, restores it back. Mm -hmm. But the Lorentz force is initially not very important. Comes on much much later on. So that's why the dynamo is run away activity but the more important guy is the the diffusion who will compete with this gro growth process so then we have to ask who wins and the person who worked this out is cousin safe um, and he used a specific model uh, he used like a general model only but uh, uh, his model of the flow is uh, this two point correlator which which has this special property that it is delta correlated in time. And because it's delta correlated in time, it has no memory, completely random. So that allows us to get exact solutions for this problem. And uh, the main results from this calculation uh, is that um, you get a growth rate, which is on the dynamical time scale. So it's a fast dynamo. And uh, this, the magnetic spectrum is given as k to the 3 halves, which means most of your fields are on large k. Okay, So you would think that everything is on such small scales, it must be all noise in there. But on saturation, once the Lorentz force becomes important, things can change, and it may not be all noise in there. Yeah. Uh, you may have uh, growth for a certain period of time, but eventually the resistivity will catch up, and uh, over a long period of time it may not survive. I mean, that is what is the anti dynamo theorem given by Cowling. Um, but the one, uh, what do you say? Uh, one drawback of those anti-dynamo theorems is that they don't really take turbulence into account. They are generally taking a given generic flow, which could be maybe laminar. And uh, there you don't, um, the other thing, the other important thing is since you are working with 2D system, you may not get exponential growth because for that you need, uh, you know, stretching, twisting, folding, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't think you get it. I mean, I've not tried it. 
Yeah, you're not supposed to get a dynamo action. It's simply there in the equation. It's like, it's very similar to the, the vorticity equation. And vorticity will have, again, the same property. You don't get the stretching of the vorticity in 2D, right? So the same thing will apply to. Some yeah, yeah, yeah. So the 2D system in magnetic field also has similar things in it. So, uh, but that's a different thing. So, um, to look at large scale dynamo, we resort to the mean field theory. So, the physical picture for large scale dynamo was provided by Parker. And the actual mathematical formulation of the large scale dynamo problem was given by Steinbeck, Radler, and Cross. So what we do here is we split the relevant quantities into mean and fluctuations. And then we require all these averaging to satisfy certain Reynolds rules, uh, which are you know, common sense rules. Um, so you have the sum, uh, the mean, the average of two of uh, of a sum is equal to the mean of the sums, uh, sum of the means. Sorry, and uh, then importantly, the product of mean and fluctuation when averaged will give you zero. Then, so we are averaging the 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 given field. And that will give you the mean. And, huh? Why is the capital U bar? Uh, uh, well, if we are um, applying spatial averages, OK, we don't know uh, a priori. Um, well, it, I mean, so it's not precise already to begin with, but suppose we are applying, uh, say, spatial averages to a given box. Suppose I take, uh, take a 3D box and I apply XY horizontal averages. Then I get a mean field in the, in the Z direction. Yeah. So that's what I... Uh, mean to say or if you if one is doing temporal average, uh, averages over uh, many eddy turnover times then the, the the field that remains would be the mean over those averages so why is the fluctuation small i understood reason why this so is the small scale yeah. fluctuation small and are you yeah, magnitude that? I am not assuming that the small scale fluctuations have to be, I mean, they are basically fluctuations. So if I take an average, they have to go to zero. That is essentially what I'm asking uh, from it. I'm, so it's not large and small. Uh, I mean, so, usually means that. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I would think that depending on how you average, then you can say that this is, a la this is large and this is small, uh, small scale. Yeah. So there's no sense of magnitude. magnitude. Like, is it big or small? And he's saying basically, like, when you're calling something a fluctuation, does it also mean that it's smaller than magnitude? Like, for example, if you're linearizing about something, then you're talking right. about it. Oh, right. So I'm saying that the strength may not be small, but the scales on which it operates can be is, is small, depending on my averaging. No, uh, that's the key dependence. Hmm. But, uh, just the magnitude. The magnitude itself doesn't have to be small. Uh, I mean, that is something that we are actually uh, having trouble with, <laughs> because. Uh, turns out that the, the fluctuations are not small in my, in, 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 in my dynamo system. Uh, and uh, that has been the bane of the, the, the mean field theory for so long, actually. So one can then um, substitute these, the split into the induction equation. And uh, all the products of the mean and fluctuations go to zero. So 
the term that importantly remains is the product of two, two fluctuating quantities. Okay, and that 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 will turn out to be the most very important thing, which is responsible for the growth of the mean field dynamo. You can also get an equation for the fluctuating field by subtracting the to the equation for of, for total field. Sorry, the equation for mean field from the total field. Okay, and now if you wanted to estimate this EMF uh, with a given u, then you have to de determine what is a small b. And that is coming from the equation for fluctuating fields. And that also again has quantities which are second order in fluctuations. So then the EMF will become third order in fluctuations. So then if you want to estimate the third order quantity, then you have to go to the fourth order in fluctuations and so on. So this is like a closure problem, right? So the simplest closure that we can make is drop the higher order terms and then, then solve for just a second order quantity and, and by uh, making an approximation saying we can express it in terms of the mean field and uh, uh, spatial derivative of the mean field. So this, these coefficients sitting next to uh, uh, these terms is, uh, are known as the turbulent transport coefficients and alpha is the, is the, is the important alpha effect which is responsible for uh, large scale dynamo action. And this eta t is the turbulent diffusion responsible for the destruction of the uh, mean field or the large scale field. Is that assumption, you know, and classification? Yeah. It's an ansatz. It's an ansatz. It's an ansatz which is then which uh, which then works out by kind of when we drop these other terms. And uh, I mean, but this is an answer. That, that's true. So when you do uh, get through this calculation, turns out that this alpha term, uh, this alpha coefficient, is directly proportional to the kinetic helicity in the flow, uh, which is what we said we need to be able to drive a large scale dynamo. Now I want to provide a physical picture of a large scale dynamo. Here what I have in the scheme is uh, that you begin with say poloidal field and from poloidal field you generate the toroidal field and then back uh, to poloidal field from toroidal fields and that will kind of complete the cycle for self sustenance. So. In, the, in this disk over here, I have a poloidal field to begin with. Then the differential rotation will bring you to the toroidal plane. And this is the easy part of the problem. The more difficult part is uh, getting back the poloidal field. So this is where kinetic helicity will come in. So the helical motions in the turbulence will kind of twist the magnetic field up and then you know bring in these um, poloidal fields, which can then diffuse back and and, and um, reinstate the or uh, regenerate the poloidal fields. Large yeah, large scale fields. Yeah. So, um, so that was the brief thing on large scale dynamo. Now I want to come back to small scale dynamo and em emphasize on its importance, mainly because in um, okay, running out of time. Uh, in um, in most of the literature, there has been a lot of emphasis on the large scale dynamo solutions. And uh, the small scale dynamo has been largely not worried about too much, even though it is present in the same system. And the small scale dynamo grows really, really fast. So it is going to be problematic for the large scale uh, dynamo action. So in, in fact, understanding large scale dynamo re really requires understanding small scale dynamo in the first place. So this is something that I wanted to emphasize. So um, during my PhD, so I'm going to take you through some of the results on small scale dynamo because by itself it's an entity and we want to understand it better so that we can understand uh, other components of dynamo theory better. So during my PhD, I, I worked on the kinematic small scale dynamo and uh, 
like I showed you previously, the original cousin safe calculation was with uh, delta correlation in time kind of model. So the, what we did is to extend it uh, to include the effects of uh, finite time correlation. So we took a model which, uh, which has these random variables which change only after a time interval of tau and get through the calculation and we find new terms. Uh, basically extend the uh, cousin save equation um, and with tau going to zero you recover the original equation and um, uh, these new terms that come in uh, are the first order contributions okay so it turns out that if I then solve this again then I actually get back uh, the magnetic spectrum that was uh, the result of the original cousin's e equation, which is k to the three halves, and that is independent of tau. Though the growth rate itself goes down a bit due to this, uh, this the finite time correlation. So this was an interesting result. Then uh, we also applied uh, uh, the, okay, so like I, I was mentioning to Pratik earlier, so there are these uh, astrophysical systems where the rotation is quite weak. So we don't expect large scale dynamo action there. So the question is how do we get a coherent magnetic field? So we have to fall back on uh, the small scale dynamo and ask if the small scale dynamo can generate fields by the time saturation happens, which are coherent enough. So what we did is run a bunch of simulations and then uh, look at Faraday rotation measures from those simulations and turns out that um, okay the Faraday rotation measure values that I show here are uh, normalized by a model which will give you a best estimate for such a stochastic system and uh, the rotation measure that I get here initially is like 20 percent of the best model I mean the best estimate and by the time it saturates goes goes to about 40 to 50 percent. And if I translate that into actual number for uh, the astrophysical system in question, then it is about 180 radians per meter square. And those are the kind of values that, uh, that were there already in the plot that I showed you earlier on uh, in, in the Faraday rotation measure study. So um, I also want to point out that these type of studies will be important when the SKA data comes along. Now an important point to take away So it is an integral uh, integral b dot dl. So it's like along the line line of sight, you are uh, integrating all the, the magnetic field component along the line of sight. So the, the the magnetic field which is parallel to the line of sight, we are summing up on that. That is what is uh, the rotation measure. How do you observe observation of it? What is parallel rotation? Uh, so observationally, if you have like these radio sources in the background uh, and uh, the radio sources are emitting, emitting some, uh, have an emission which has random polarization, but then if it passes through a medium which has magnetic fields, that can provide like uh, a certain polarization to the, this, this emission. And uh, that is, um, that measure is known as the Faraday rotation measure. Um, yes, 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 and the angle of rotation is, 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 is the Faraday rotation measure. And uh, this calculation can kind of lead to a simple estimate for Faraday rotation measure, which is given by integral b, b per, uh, parallel uh, b dot dl. So if you have a line, line of sight. Uh, along along which you are integrating, then you are integrating the line of sight magnetic field. It's from the uh, direct numerical simulation. Uh, it's just uh, uh, I don't know MHT equations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm employing uh, turbulent random turbulent fields. I mean. Forcing function in the momentum equation is going to drive a uh, isotropic homogeneous kind of turbulence. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh, I, yeah, uh, because it's a stochastic system, I can just take, a, 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 like, I suppose uh, I keep, uh, uh, I, I go along Z. Uh, so on an XY plane, I, I, uh, I take every uh, XY point uh, along the Z, which is going to give me a Faraday rotation measure value. And this is, this, this is not going to be constant, of course. It can have a distribution. It can be zero or it can be whatever. What I'm plotting is actually the sigma of that distribution. So the sigma will, may, will not be zero. And that is what is the interesting thing about the, the small scale dynamo. Uh, I mean, the co there are coherent fields which kind of give you non-zero uh, rotation measures. Uh, uh, it is, um, it's not a delta, the, the forcing itself is delta correlated in time, but the, the velocity fields that do come up are not delta correlated in time. Uh, it's fairly isotropic homogeneous kind of turbulence that comes up. Huh, that is, that was just a model. But this is actual uh, DNS simulation. Yeah, yeah. But that was uh, like a velocity uh, flow that one takes into consideration for an analytical problem. Whereas here I am uh, doing simulations where I have a forcing term in the momentum equation which is driving the turbulence. Length over which I'm integrating, yes. I mean, uh, so this is, sorry, this is a model that is coming out of, you know, this stochastic system. So it's, uh, it's very similar to, uh, you know, the root n that you get for in case of when you are looking at the, at a random walk problem, the root n that you get, it's similar to that, the root, uh, root of L here. So uh, the L is the large L in the system, and the small L is for a, singular, a single turbulent cell. So L divided by L will give you the number of turbulent cells, and that's what is the root N over there. Yeah. So um, yeah, so my main point over here is that uh, by the time the system saturates, the 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 fields become pretty coherent and that is also seen by you know how the the sigma rm is directly related to the integral scale of the magnetic fields or root root of that and uh, this is important because uh, we don't understand small scale dynamo saturation yet and there are a couple of models in the in the in the literature uh, one model says that there is a universal saturated state which which means that the, the fields do get more coherent by the time saturation occurs. And uh, the other model says that uh, the fields re keep remaining at small scales. And if uh, the second model is, is what it is, then you wouldn't actually see the coherent, uh, you know, the Faraday rotation measure that you actually see in observations. So uh, this was going to be the main thing of uh, uh, the discussion today that what is the interaction between small scale dynamo and the, the large scale dynamo. So for a long time, um, the small scale dynamo was not taken into consideration to the calculations of large scale dynamo. And that has come to become like a pain. And so um, one has to deal with uh, all of that now. Uh, so Kulstrud in 92 pointed out that small scale dynamo is much faster and thus problematic for mean field theory. So what we typically do in the, in the, uh, in the closure approximation is we throw out this G term which has these higher order correlations. And uh, if the mean flow is zero, then this small b is actually coming from this term, which, which implies that there's like tangling of the mean field which is giving you small scale fields. So the small scale fields are essentially like a um, side product of the large scale dynamo. 
But this is not the case because we know that small scale dynamo is an entity by itself. So what we see is uh, in, in all of these simulations, actually in the kinematic stage, where in, in these simulations where we have both the small scale and the large scale dynamo, the, the, the strength of the large scale field to the total actually keeps going down as you increase the Reynolds number. So this is a, this is really problematic, right? Um, the other problem is to do with uh, what happens on, um, on saturation of large scale dynamo, but I'm not gonna go into that now. <coughs> so there are various proposed solutions, which I'll not tell you about uh, for the sake of time. And I'll uh, go to uh, the solution that I'm look, uh, we have look, worked on and looked at. So this is uh, an important issue that I want to flag. So I have told you how the small scale dynamo generates fields which reside on uh, large K or small scales, right? So the, this power spectrum depicts that. So you have, a, uh, you have this power spectrum which has, a, which has its peak on large K. Now, what, the question is what happens on saturation? And um, if we can, we can uh, consider two scenarios. The first scenario is where, wherein nothing happens and the small scale saturation leads to a power spectrum which is pretty much similar to what it was in the kinematic regime. Then the large scale fields that do come up on, on small k are actually pretty small compared to the total power in the system. So it gets overwhelmed by the presence of the small scale fields. But suppose the small scale fields do get more coherent and the peak shifts to larger k, uh, smaller k, then uh, the large scale fields actually have a chance of uh, appearing in, in the system, okay? So we did do, uh, simulations which have both small scale and large scale dynamo. And the second scenario prevails. So you can see that the spectrum actually looks like uh, one that I had shown you before, where you know the large scale field is over here and the small scale field is here. And uh, these are some curves which again are showing the how the magnetic integral scale of the small scale fields are increasing from the kinematic regime to the saturation, which means that fields are getting more coherent, which means that large scale fields do have a chance of coming up. Um, so essentially, let me show you this plot, where uh, in these simulations across uh, with the different magnetic Reynolds number, the initial large scale field has a strength which varies with respect to magnetic Reynolds number, but by the time it saturates, the strengths come uh, pretty close to each other, which means on saturation, things do get better. So this, this, uh, this is an important result. Then we can do better than this. Um, and what we see in one of our recent simulations is that after the small scale dynamo gets saturated, actually there is, a, there is another um, stage altogether for the large scale dynamo where it, it, it acts standalone. So during this kinematic regime, all of them are growing together. And that's where we think that, oh, the large scale field doesn't have a chance to appear because you know all the small scale fields are kind of overwhelming it. But when the small scale fields get saturated, this large scale dynamo does its own thing uh, by growing exponentially with albeit a smaller growth rate. And this is, no, this is what we have called as a quasi-kinematic large scale dynamo. And this is like a new result that we see in our simulation. Right. No, no. So this is a simulation where I have helical turbulence. So the, the, we can have both uh, small scale and large scale dynamo. Yeah. This is really a helical dynamo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
this is, yeah. So this kind of stuff was not seen in the previous simulations. Uh, but uh, this is like a new result because the parameter regime that we have looked at, it's like, um, it, it's such that this, this growth rate is really large and this growth rate is quite small. So this can actually make an appearance. And this kind of simulations were not done because people who are, who are doing dynamos are largely looking at the solar guy uh, and the, so, the, so the parameter space for solar guy is like PM less than one, which is not amenable for, you know, like a really fast, small scale dynamo. So, um, yeah, so this is, again, I just wanted to show how this M1 guy is growing uh, uh, exponentially, while this M4, uh, the, 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 the energy at smaller scales is growing linearly. And so this is depicting how large scale dynamo is operating on its own after the small scale dynamo is kind of saturated. And uh, yeah, this is again a slide which was explaining just now what I told uh, Pratik, that we are in a parameter space which is uh, amenable to that. So these, these images are um, from such a simulation and you can see how the fields are initially very small and then they, they grow to occupy the, the, the same scales as the, the scale of the box. So these have certain implications for astrophysics. Um, so we can obtain a large scale dynamo on dynamical time scales. And uh, from initial simulations, we see that uh, with varying RM, the, the quasi-kinematic large scale dynamo is, uh, is not RM dependent. And most importantly, the mean field that we do get is about 25% of the equipartition value, which is, which is what we see in, 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 in the spiral galaxies. So the other uh, important problem is to do with helicity fluxes. So in 3D MHD, uh, there's, uh, there's an important quantity known as the magnetic helicity, which is a well-conserved quantity as compared to the magnetic energy. So that can constrain the nonlinear evolution of uh, uh, dynamos. So if we invoke that, uh, uh, that constraint, then the player that comes into the game is what is known as helicity flux. And that is something that I'm currently looking at University of Leeds. And uh, I'm using uh, this code called Daedalus, which is like a flex flexible framework to, for solving differential equations. And this aspect we think will be useful to understand, understand nonlinear linear evolution because we will be able to tweak the models for, to our liking. And uh, one has obtained uh, time on all these pre supercomputers for running because these systems need, need to be at really large magnetic Reynolds numbers, which is what we are targeting, which is what most astrophysical systems are. Uh, at. So um, this is something that's ongoing. And uh, thus I come upon the summary and some future directions. So the um, extension of uh, the kinematic small scale dynamo problem to finite time correlation uh, gives us the same uh, cousin safe spectrum independent of tau. Then the small scale fields on saturation uh, from the small scale dynamo become pretty coherent, which is very important to get uh, the observables that we do see in systems like galaxy clusters. Then in, in, in kinematic regime, the small scale field and the large scale field grow together. And, and thus there's a uniform. But once the small scale field has saturated, the large scale dynamo can do its own thing and that is what we see uh, in uh, some of our recent simulations, and we have termed it as a quasi-kinematic large-scale dynamo. Then the future work that I want to do is, uh, is to understand the large-scale dynamo saturation itself, uh, which will involve studying helicity fluxes. Then also one also wants to understand the quasi-kinematic uh, large-scale dynamo, 
uh, better with its dependence on magnetic Reynolds number and so on. An important thing that I've not mentioned here is uh, to challenge the mean field theory or to extend the mean field theory in its understanding because currently what we see is that mean field theory is, is not sufficient to understand the large scale dynamo action. So that will also be the focus of uh, all these projects. Yeah, thank you.